Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus again today. This is episode five of five, our final episode this week on flight. I know you're disappointed, I am too. It's been a really cool week. We've talked about how airplanes learn to fly. We've talked about what constitutes airplanes. We've talked about how we even get up there. And then once we got up there, how we created all of this infrastructure around it and how the airplane industry came about. Today, we're gonna talk about the future of flying. What's gonna come next for flight, right? We're gonna get meals back going to get better seatbelts? What's going on? Things are going to change in commercial flight, right? They always have. They continually do. But the things that are going to change are things like how fast planes are going to go, how quickly we're going to get places. And the inside of the plane is going to change. The seats are going to move around. Amenities are going to change. How airports run, how planes look. And, you know, there might even come a time when we don't even need airplanes the way that we think of them now. If you really think about it, We've only really had airplanes in a commercial and mass capacity for like 50 or 60 years. The way that you think of them now is relatively recent and where you think of them now is not really where they're gonna be 10 years from now or where they were 10 years ago. The fastest commercial plane ever was the Concorde. It could reach twice the speed of sound or about 1500 miles an hour. And compared to a commercial plane, a normal commercial plane, those only go, you know, five, 600 miles an hour, maybe seven if you're lucky, depends on the plane. There are about 20 Concords built. And for a long time, they thought that was the future of flight, right? It was the fastest, it was sleek, but they only built 20. The first one took off January of 1976. It flew between London and New York. It took two hours and 52 minutes. That is fast. But the planes stopped flying in 2003. So they weren't the future of air flight. We know it's possible to fly that fast. And we know that people have flown on commercial flights at supersonic speeds. So the question is, is that going to be the future? I mean, maybe. Even if the Concorde isn't part of that. People are working all the time on making commercial flights faster. There have been a number of companies working on the next supersonic commercial plane, the next Concorde. But just recently, NASA awarded a contract to Lockheed Martin to try to make not only a plane that flies at supersonic speeds, but one that does it greener, or more greenly, and also more quietly. They refer to it as what's called a, quote, low boom aircraft. So there's no loud noise when it breaks the sound barrier. Instead, it just kind of makes a quiet thump. <laughs> the Concorde was actually not allowed to fly over some airspace because it was too loud. Others have suggested that they can make planes that fly above the atmosphere. So instead of flying you know, at 30 or 40,000 feet, it flies above 60,000 and even higher than that, out of the atmosphere at least a little bit, because the higher up you go, the less friction you get from the air and the atmosphere and the faster you can move with less drag. One of the plans uh, is a project called ZEST, the Zero Emission High Speed Transport, and it would run on seaweed <laughs> and it would be able to travel super, super fast. Some say supersonic commercial travel might one day be just a regular thing. You know, planes are being designed and tested all the time, but it's very expensive. And there's not a lot of return on your investment until you can get other people to then buy the planes that you've built. So it's gonna be somebody who's super rich who funds one of these planes and then is able to sell it to a commercial carrier. Getting back to that airplane though that runs on seaweed, I mean, alternative energy could really revolutionize airplanes, right? People ask all the time why airplanes don't run on solar power or why there aren't more green energy systems built into their airplanes. There are problems with that because there are currently test airplanes flying on solar energy, but it probably won't be the future just because we are all collectively too heavy. The passengers are heavy, the cargo is heavy, the airplane itself is heavy. One successful solar plane can travel 30 to 40 miles an hour, not nearly fast enough to really go anywhere, not a practical way to travel. Perhaps you remember NASA's uh, solar airplane. It looked like a giant flying wing with lots of different propellers, like a Miyazaki film or something. It was crazy. Could fly for a long, long time, but even that couldn't fly forever. And it couldn't really carry that much. There are signs that one day we'll have smaller four-seat airplanes running on electrical batteries. In 2015, the electric E-Fan became the first electric plane to fly across, wait for it, 
the English Channel, guys. Whew. Real far. But the real future with large airliners is actually more like biofuels. That'll cut down on carbon dioxide emissions. In, in 2015, Chinese Hanyan Airlines flew a commercial flight using a mixture of jet fuel and also cooking oil. And that's pretty crazy. But uh, greasy? Whatever. It basically cuts down on the emissions because a big problem with the airline industry is that it's a big polluter, unfortunately. But they're working on it. The way we fly in planes and what the planes look like on the inside to us as well, I mean, look how far we've come already. Yes, we used to have, you know, dining and more luxurious travel, but in the last 20 years, stiff, boring seats with little teeny televisions 10 seats away, those turned into seats with TVs that fold down into beds and things with Wi-Fi on them. And some companies are talking about virtual reality headsets on your airplanes right at your seat which does seem kind of like the obvious next step for in-flight entertainment, doesn't it? But imagine sitting next to somebody who's kind of flailing around because they're in VR. That'd be kind of annoying. But, you know, whatever. I'm not designing these things. Or how about like a windowless airplane that has an interior covered with high-definition screens that are flexible and that make it look like the plane is see-through? No thank you. Not interested. But there are people who are trying to do these things. Uh, there's also funky concepts of how to make flying more comfortable, like, you know, different seat designs and more cushy things and essentially kind of ways to make your time in the air more comfortable so that even if the plane doesn't go faster, it's less of a drudge to get there. One really interesting thing I saw while doing all this research was a concept of moving the cockpit from the front of the plane to the back. One company patented a concept of a back-of-the-plane cockpit in order to make the front of the plane, one, more aerodynamic and with the hope of flying these planes more efficiently. So they'd come lighter and thinner and the wings will look different and the nose will change, the tail will change, and things will look all sorts of different crazy ways. Look, in the end, these things are going to look different and we're all going to have to prepare ourselves for all of the different things that engineers are going to try and companies are also going to try. A thing was going around Facebook a while ago about sitting people, some people frontwards and some people backwards to fit more people into airplanes. I hope it doesn't go that way. That's, that's pretty scary. But now I want to ask the big question. You ready? What if the future of flying doesn't even involve airplanes? Where are our flying cars? I just want to say I hate flying cars. I hate the idea of flying cars. They're the worst. People cannot drive in two dimensions. That being said, Let's talk about flying cars. Flying cars have been around for over 100 years. In 1917, not long after the Wright brothers, right? Glenn Curtis patented a flying car, the Curtis Autoplane. It was a car with wings on it and never actually managed to fly. A lot of the flying cars that have been made are really just airplanes that can drive, or so it would seem. Uh, the problem is that if wheels are what move a car along with the engine, the wings are what allow a plane to drive, if you will, right? So you can't take a car with a wingspan onto a freeway. Yes, there have been prototypes of cars with removable wings and tails, but come on, nobody wants that. It's terrible. Look up videos. It's, it's the worst. You want a car that you can just take off, fly around, and land. Back to the future. Recently, a car company patented a car with stacked wings on top. So instead of wings sticking out the side, there are four stacked on top of it. And this way, you could drive and the car would take off and then land again. But come on, that thing is super expensive and there's an airspace legality thing and you'd have to have air traffic controllers just to drive to the store. That would be insane. But there are numerous companies working on the problem of two-dimensional versus three-dimensional commercial driving, right? And there have been some successful prototypes that have the ability to fly and drive and fit in a garage, and that might happen in our lifetime. But part of the problem is the propulsion methods that we use now. You know, engines are too heavy, and gasoline doesn't pack enough punch. Jets don't even use the same fuel. It needs a higher octane, more punchy fuel just to make it all work, right? You can't necessarily do that for your car. But maybe we should just do a whole series on flying cars. I don't know. Let us know. Another idea thrown around a lot is personal drones. This year at CES, a company unveiled a personal drone that you could pilot yourself, and it looks kind of like a personal mini helicopter. 
It can travel 62 miles an hour. It can travel for about 23 minutes. That's more than enough to, for most people to commute. But of course, there are still those pesky airspace regulations. There's also safety and cost and control. And all of these are factors that are making this a difficult future. But that doesn't mean it's not coming. In my mind, this lines up more with what a future would be. So, you know, cars that fly probably less cool than getting into one of these things and have it take off. But a drone that can hover over the road and then zoom up into the air, that sounds great, right? Guys, this has been a crazy series. We started with some bicycle dudes flying in North Carolina in a windy day. And we're ending with personal drones flying you from your door all the way to work. Now combine that with like your imagination, right? Flying cars that seem kind of small when you think of how self-driving cars could mean self-driving jetpacky things like self-driving mini drones and all sorts of stuff. Fleets of, of you know, mini drones that pick you up at your work and then fly away to go pick up somebody else at the grocery store ordered by your phone. I mean, who knows where this is gonna go, but flight is definitely just kicking off. We've only had it for a hundred years so far. There's a lot more to do. One final thanks to Boeing for helping us cover all of this great flight stuff. Boeing, building the future one century at a time. Let us know down in the comments what you think the future of flight is gonna look like. Also, make sure you subscribe, please, here on TestTube. If you haven't subscribed and you're listening to me right now, hi, nice to hear you too. Subscribe, please. Also, make sure you come find us on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. The show is at TestTube. Thanks a lot for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it. We do this show for you every week, and we love it. Thanks a lot. See you next time on Test Tube Plus. Plus.